in his grip with Dr. Chuck Betters of Mark Inc. Ministries. Today we are reaching back into the archives. Today's message is titled, Will Christians Go Through the Tribulation? Part 1. From the series, Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. Each message is designed to help turn your heart towards Jesus and equip you to walk by faith. Let's join Dr. Betters in the sanctuary. Daniel chapter 7, we continue our study on the doctrines of eschatology. Eschatology simply meaning the study of events yet to be or the study of the future. And we have asked the question, why do we do this? Why do we study eschatology? And we've listed several reasons for you, not the least of which is to impress upon us the fact that our God, who is a sovereign God, controls or is lord over history. History is literally his story. And so when we see the events of Old Testament and New Testament prophecy beginning to fit together and we come to read our newspapers and and look at what is happening in the world around us, we realize very quickly if we truly understand the doctrines of eschatology that our God reigns and our God is in control. He is not looking down upon the events of earth and saying to himself, uh, whoops or oops, or I wish I had tried this, or I wish I had tried that. Our God reigns. He is sovereign. And as we see scripture beginning to piece together, we're continually impressed by that. We have looked at the major systems of eschatology and some of the flaws that exist in systems that are Uh, uh, not the amillennial or realized system. What we will be preaching from this point on is a system simply called realized eschatology or realized millennium. Simply stated, it comes out like this. We are living in the kingdom. Our God reigns in heaven with those who have died before us and his kingdom in a very real sense of the word is there. And yet his kingdom exists on earth. That is, among us who are believers, our God reigns. So as he reigns in heaven, he reigns on earth. We are in that kingdom right now. The next event we are looking for is the coming of Jesus Christ, where he will bring judgment to the earth, where he will bring both believers and non-believers before his great white throne, and he will usher in the final state, which is a new heaven, and a new earth. Now that is in sharp contrast to those who would promote a two-phased coming. That meaning that Christ will come first of all in some sort of secret rapture. Many of you have been taught that. Over the years many of you have embraced that system. I hope that as we continue to study the Word of God you will see that that system is fraught full of holes that there is no secret rapture. That is Christ coming for the Gentile church and then establishing some sort of an earthly kingdom after a period of tribulation. There are some who would teach that Christians will be taken out of the world before the tribulation that the Bible speaks of. There are some who teach that the Christian will be raptured, that it will be a secret event. This theory has been promoted by such people as Hal Lindsey in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and many others who over the years have embraced a doctrinal system that simply is called the pre-tribulational view. That is that the church will be taken out before the tribulation. I think that is offering to Christians something that is not biblical. The Bible clearly teaches that we will go through not only tribulation in its generic sense, but the tribulation or the great tribulation that the Bible speaks of as a last day or end time event. And so we will be preaching and teaching this system to you and we hope that as we study through it, you will begin to see the blessed hope of the church is the second coming of Christ. Well, the question needs to be asked, where did this secret rapture view come from? Uh, Prior to 1830, I must say this. 
And I think you all need to understand that the weight of church history clearly justifies what I'm about to say. Before the year 1830, there is not one shred of evidence anywhere of any theologian, any church father, any of the great uh, reformers who embraced a secret rapture view. There's not one. Clearly, in studying church history, the reformers and the church fathers and the great church historians taught that the church will go through the tribulation that we will not be secretly taken out, but we will go through the tribulation at the end of which Christ will come again and bring to an end the heavens and the earth as we know them and create a new heaven and a new earth. So where did the view come from? Well, when we look, for example, at uh, church history, we, uh, and I've just uh, cited a few here, and we don't have the time to go through all of these, but the great, uh, the great uh, missionary that accompanied Paul Barnabas uh, wrote in his epistle of, a, of the church going through the tribulation, uh, Clement of Rome, uh, the shepherd of Hermas, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Melito, Irenaeus, all of these guys who lived prior to A.D. 200 clearly embraced a position where the church would go through the tribulation. And then we look at people like Tertullian and Hippolytus, and I'm just mentioning a few, Cyprian and uh, 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 Athanasius and Ephraim the Syrian and Cyril of Jerusalem and Jerome and, and, and Chrysostom and Augustine, and on and on the list goes prior to 1830. Not one Christian that had any kind of credibility whatsoever taught a secret rapture. Well, the question we have to ask ourselves then is where did it come from? I would like to portray just very quickly and very briefly who the five founding fathers of this secret rapture view are. The first one I'd like to list for you is a young woman by the name of Margaret MacDonald. You need to learn that name because I believe that the weight of history proves that the origin of the secret rapture view is traceable to this woman. She lived in a place called Glasgow, if you're ready for that, Scotland. No relation to our church. Uh, she is, I believe, the founding mother of the pre-tribulational view. She allegedly had a personal, quote, vision. I've read her vision. It has 119 verses in it. And in that vision, she, for the first time in church history, separates the second coming into two steps. One, a secret coming. Two, the coming of Jesus Christ at the second coming, separated by a tribulation. She is the first one that we know of that ever separated the Christians out before the tribulation. She is the one who triggered over one and a half centuries of pre-tribulational rapture theology. She saw much of the tribulation as being passed, and yet she held tenaciously to an, a future antichrist. And by the way, I might point out this, Margaret MacDonald identified who she thought the antichrist was. She proved to be wrong, which in essence eliminates her as a prophetess because a prophet must be 100% right 100% of the time. So the best we can say about Margaret MacDonald is that she was a visionary out of the mainstream of the historic Christian faith who was at least as far as the Antichrist is concerned a false prophetess, yet she is the first to identify a secret rapture. Picking up on this vision was a man, secondly, by the name of John Darby. In 1850, he was the one who systematized the 119 verses of Margaret MacDonald's vision into a theory, and yet he admitted that the theory was full of holes. John Darby toured America, and he promoted what we now know today as the Plymouth Brethren Movement along with this view of a secret rapture. In other words, John Darby got a hold of the teachings of Margaret MacDonald, systematized it, and toured the country as the founding father of the Plymouth Brethren movement. 
identifying a secret rapture that the whole weight of church history never knew of. The third founding father is a man by the name of Edward Irving. He was a contemporary of John Darby, lived around the same time. At first, Edward Irving was a Presbyterian minister, but he left the Presbyterian church and became the founder of his own denomination that he called the Catholic Apostolic Church, which was a Catholic charismatic group. And as he left the, uh, uh, the, the, um, the Presbyterian Church, this group that he founded were nicknamed the Irvingites. And he was the first one to identify, for example, the sealing of the saints in Revelation, where it talks about the sealing of the 144,000. He then took us back to the teachings of Margaret MacDonald and said that sealing means that we're taken out of the world before this great tribulation falls. So now we have a visionary who proved to be a false prophetess. We have John Darby, the founder of the Plymouth Brethren Movement. We have a Catholic charismatic who embraced these theories, but none of them carried as much credibility as the fourth one. The fourth one is a man by the name of Cyrus I. Schofield. In fact, there may be some of you sitting here right now who have in your laps a Cyrus I. Schofield reference Bible. This is the Bible that is the lifeblood of the pre-trib view. Very few pre-trib churches will allow their parishioners to have anything but a C.I. Schofield Bible. Because in that Bible, written in 19, or first published in 1909, C.I. Schofield systematized in writing and placed alongside of the scriptures a reference system to show that the church was not going to go through the tribulation, that God's purposes were ultimately for Israel, and he was the one who split the second coming into two phases. But do you know who C.I. Schofield was? I think it's important that you understand that Dr. C.I. Schofield who published that Bible in 1909, was also a man who was convicted of forgery and spent considerable time imprisoned. C.I. Schofield, while he was in prison in a St. Louis jail, met the daughter of a very wealthy businessman who lived in the St. Louis area. She was visiting the prisons on behalf of a, of a mission outreach. And she befriended uh, C.I. Schofield while he was in jail serving his term as a forger. And they, get, they began a relationship, and as the, as the, the, the events unfold, C.I. Schofield, while in prison, becomes a Christian. And this woman uses her influence with her father, who then pays the bill to relieve him of the debts that he had incurred as the result of his forgery, and he is released from prison. He marries this woman and has children by her. The thing that then happens next is really befuddling to, to many, and it's quite an embarrassment to those who would truly try to unveil the history behind C.I. Schofield. As the story goes, Dr. Schofield became such a vibrant and excitable Christian that he was quite taken back by the fact that his wife was not as excited about her faith as he was. And so, contrary to the advice that Paul gives to believers who are married to unbelievers in the book of 1 Corinthians, Schofield divorces his wife and leaves her and her children and refuses to give them any financial support. He was quite a politician. He was capable of invading many of the electric, uh, electrifying, I should say, pulpits across America. He became politically active not only in government, but he became politically active in the lives of the men who were pastoring some of the larger churches in the country in order to sell his product. One of them, not the least of which, was Dr. D.L. Moody. 
And I don't know how many people realize this, but the officiating minister at D.L. Moody's funeral was Dr. C.I. Schofield. And so you see he made great inroads into many of the great pulpits of the country, promoting the doctrines of McDonald, promoting the doctrines of Darby, promoting the doctrines of the Irvingites, and selling his newly published Bible. Let me give you a fifth founding father of the pre-trib view. I'm simply going to call it the electronic church. May I suggest to you that for a large majority of those who are what we call the TV preachers today, if you remove the secret rapture, you have taken away the lifeblood of their pulpits. They live and they die by the secret rapture theories which have no biblical basis whatsoever. So let's summarize it this way. Where did the secret rapture theory come from? Well, we know it came nowhere before 1830, but that Margaret MacDonald, a young visionary, had a vision, 119 verses worth. The roots of the secret rapture theory are in a Scottish girl who, pr who proved to be a false prophetess. The question I have, and it's an amazing phenomenon when you take a look at it, when you look across Christendom today, thousands and thousands and thousands of pastoral leaders are preaching a secret rapture view. I maintain to you that as I stand up here today and preach this particular view and take exception with the secret rapture view, I am probably in the minority. It won't be the first time that I am in the minority. And it probably won't be the last time that I'm in the minority. But the question you have to answer is whether or not there is any scriptural credence to a secret rapture. Will the church go through the tribulation? Well, I hope you have Daniel by now. <laughs> Chapter 7. I want to take a little tour through several verses of Daniel 7 through 11. Now watch very quickly as we do this. Daniel 7 verse 7 says this. It says, after that, in my vision, at night I looked. And there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying, frightening, and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. You are reading there, friends, about the Antichrist, whom I believe is yet to come. In one sense, the Antichrist is ever-present with us. But in another sense, I believe there is, a, there is a dimension of eschatology that is yet to be realized. I do believe there is coming a day when there will be unveiled for us a political and religious figurehead called the Antichrist. But look at verse 8, it says, While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up from among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. The horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Drop down to verse 23, and he tells you this. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. Among them, another king will arise, different from the earlier run ones, and he will subdue the three kings. So now we know that this king comes from amidst the other kings who will devour the earth. They will speak boastfully. Look at chapter 8 and verse 9. It says, Out of one of them came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host, that's Christ. It took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. 
because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Verse 23. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, notice again, it's a figure, a master of intrigue will rise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The Antichrist, chapter 9. Look at verse 26. After the 62 sevens, which we'll explain in a future message, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That's a period of seven years. But in the middle of that seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And one who causes desolation will place abominations on the wing of the temple until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Notice the hatred. Notice the venom. Notice the power that this figure, whoever he is, has toward the church. He hates the things of Christ. He opposes the things of Christ. And he hates the people of God and seeks to trample on the people of God. But the thing I want you to notice is that while he is here, it is against the church of God that he is launching his attack. But wait a minute, I thought we were taken out. I thought we were secretly raptured. There's no such picture, at least in the book of Daniel. Look at chapter 11, beginning with verse uh, 36. Chapter 11 and verse 36. It says the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god, and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. Now we could have a real field day with that. We could start getting into the trap of trying to identify who the Antichrist is. Uh, back in the 1930s, people believed that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. There are some who are preaching from their pulpits today that Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist. Certainly in one sense of the word, they were Antichrist. But I think we get very dangerously close to uh, stepping outside of the bounds of biblical prophecy when we try to identify who the Antichrist is. Suffice it to say that in the book of Daniel, we have a picture of a political figure who has a hatred for God and a hatred for the things of God. He hates his church. He hates the sacrifices of his church. And he seeks to pour out his, his anger and his wrath and his venom against the people of God and does everything he can to trample them under but yet some maintain that we've been secretly raptured. Now friends, we believe 
that the Antichrist will come and will reign for a seven year period. Now, once again, I think we have to be very careful about saying that the seven represents a literal seven. The number seven in apocalyptic literature simply means a completed period of time. That completed period of time could be 100 years, it could be 200 years, it could be 1,000 years. It could be a, a definite period of time, but the number seven simply means a completed period, determined from the beginning to the end. Please don't fall into the trap of believing that the seven-year period must be seven 365-day periods. Thank you for listening to In His Grip, a ministry of Mark Inc. You just listened to the first part of Dr. Better's message titled, Will Christians Go Through the Tribulation? Part One, from the series, Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. You can download the full sermon at www.markinc.org. Visit us online at markinc.org where you will find many free resources that offer help and hope to the hurting. Please help us keep In His Grip on the air with your gifts. Visit markinc.org where you can safely give or call us toll free at 877 mark Inc. No gift is too small. Thank you for listening and for your support.